what an end to last week and what a snoozer today it would seem though perhaps not without a little bit of fireworks uh, for the financial markets once we see a little bit of action return following last week's holiday shortened week this is macro money i'm Ilias pivak head of global macro here at tasty live we're going to take a look at what might move these markets this week from the macro side of things because it looks like the price action here is whispering something a bit ominous but we'll but we're going to have to get the uh backing and the fuel for it it would seem over the course of this week before the markets are prepared to make up their mind and on one hand that gives investors something to do it gives them a bit of a uh, a pause to find an entry point in here but on the other hand it creates a bit of uncertainty the lack of conviction keeping a lot of question marks around what may happen next and that's what we're going to focus on here because it looks like the markets are at decision time they're going to have to make up their mind here one way or another. And as we begin this month of June, here's what's going to help them do it. First, though, let's get our handle on exactly how we got here and uh, what is setting up seemingly. This is uh, the performance for the major markets last week. And you can see there's not a whole lot to take away from this. Gold had a big week and then stalled crude oil continued to decline uh as that market seems to be moving uh for weeks now around its own catalysts this time around uh the focus was uh as ever on the possibility that maybe there'll be a ceasefire uh in the israel uh, gaza situation coupled with some chatter out of opec that met expectations on extending uh, supply cuts, but uh, also laid out a timetable for unwinding those uh, supply cuts. It seemed like there was maybe a bit of a downdraft from that. Oil still choosing seemingly to ignore broader macro forces. Uh, but the main takeaway here from last week seems to be the sort of soggy performance from equities. NASDAQ down one and a half percent the s p down again after a slight decline in the preceding week but the general sort of uh mood in the equities space defensive yields a bit higher at the long end so bonds pulling back a bit but that not really extending into the the two-year and near-term policy expectations and so one would be forgiven looking at all of this uh to say you know there doesn't really seem to be a strong unifying theme. But if equity defensiveness was the path of least resistance, then Friday's price action, where that leaves us today, is really a very curious set of circumstances. And that's what defines, perhaps, the crucial moment that we're in here. So... Here's the S&P uh, future here, just as a baseline for risk appetite. And what we see is we come back from uh, the Memorial Day holiday right here, and we start to slide. And the slide is orderly. The pullbacks are very shallow. The bias clearly on the downside for much of last week. We find over here the PCE data which is the first real big piece of macro event risk last week. And it comes in broadly in line with expectations, as one might have anticipated, and as we discussed here, was the likely course. Because once you get CPI and PPI numbers in hand, forecasting this tends to be a relatively simple exercise for markets. They tend to get these forecasts about right. So we posited that you'd get a number somewhere close to expectations, that this would be relief for markets. Because much of what this was all about was a reduction in rate cut odds, not for this year, where they've been steady basically since mid-April, give or take a few basis points, 
at about a cut and a half, and that's it. It's next year's tally that has been on the move. And what we've seen is that next year's tally has been significantly diminished. If we look at the expectations currently, as a matter of fact, and we'll look at that chart in just a moment as we discuss more deeply, but you can see it here. In the gray is the expectation for where Fed policy odds uh, stand for this year. In the yellow, next year. The orange line counts them both up and gives you a cumulative count. We can see here that in April, where you got that stocks move higher, the tally for this year is actually very little changed. It's still about a cut and a half. It's the tally for next year that starts to grow, giving us a more dovish uh, overall perspective. The Fed, of course, saying we don't want to hike, but we don't have the confidence to cut. And so the spotlight, understandably, shifts further downfield into the 2025 story, less so this year's. You'll notice that stocks stop going up and start to pull back as this starts to get less dovish and comes in from more negative numbers now into less negative numbers. And so we're still expecting about a cut and a half for this year. But for next year, we've gone from 75 basis points in cuts at the middle of May to now maybe 68. But last week, it was as little as 51. And so it looks like the market is still trying to get to some understanding of whether there is a three-cut year next year or a two-cut year. And a two-cut year doesn't seem to bode well for risk sentiment. So we get the PCE number right here, and the markets go, okay, in line, another month that disinflation did not occur on the Fed's core barometer for how it's doing and whether it's succeeding. So initially, there's a bit of a rally as the event risk around this dissipates. But then the markets swoon as if to say, well, this is not the kind of data that's going to give us rate cuts sooner. This is not the kind of data that's going to uphold risk appetite. And then at the very end of the day, there is a mysterious rally that doesn't seem to have any confirmation uh, from uh, parallel moves in currencies or rates or commodities. But for whatever reason, at the end of the day on Friday, the markets rally up a storm and then stop. So as we start this week, we can see Overnight action doesn't seem to pick up on the move. There is consolidation. And when we open the first session here on Monday, we crack. So again, the path of least resistance seems to be asserting itself and saying we're heading lower. But then again, into the close, we shift right back into this range. And are left, once again, with an important decision. Was this the right move? Is this the trend? Or did something material change right here? Was this a one-off pop? Perhaps linked to month-end rebalancing? Perhaps linked to a large uh, set of orders uh, being uh, tactically adjusted? Or was this, in fact, something that was more telling of a real reversal and the start of the next leg higher for stocks? This is where we find ourselves this week. Now, on the U.S. side of the ledger, there are still two big pieces of economic news that are going to help set the stage for what this does next. The first is the service sector ISM survey. We, of course, saw the uh, manufacturing side of it earlier 
today. That was part of uh, the reason why uh, the U.S. dollar got battered today. Uh, the number was uh, meaningfully weaker than expected. We can see here a dip into uh, contraction uh, territory at a faster rate, so 48 Point seven uh, on that number. Uh, that's meaningfully weaker uh, than anticipated. Uh, the numbers uh, that the num that the market was looking for was uh, forty nine point six, which was still contraction. Uh, anything below fifty on this index is in fact contraction. Any anything above fifty is expansion. It works on a logic um, the same as PMIs, but. The expectation was that the pace of contraction would actually slow, that you'd get from 49.2 to 49.6, so a higher number, below 50 still, but higher, meaning that the pace of shrinking in manufacturing was easing. As it turned out, we actually went the other way. Now, interestingly, in parallel, we also got numbers from S&P Global that revised the their May manufacturing PMI higher from 50.9 to 51.3. So some conflicting uh, data here, but the market definitely seemed to be responding to the ISM one more so. And that gave us a weaker dollar. It gave us uh, a bit of a move down in yields and a pop in bonds. But what happens next with the service sector ought to be particularly impactful. And that's because the price component of this data tends to lead PCE and CPI by about two months' time. And so that becomes a much more critical set of circumstances. If we consider here that the U.S. economy still is in an inflation-fighting state as far as the Fed is concerned, that nothing is really falling apart as far as growth, that things are still doing relatively uh, steady business uh, on the output side of things. It is that disinflation has stopped. That is the biggest concern for Fed officials. And of course, we've heard that in spades over and over over uh, the recent weeks and months. And of course, we just saw another core PCE reading at 2.8% stuck rather than moving lower. And so this is likely to be a, an, a very important input for the Fed's policy calculus, at least as far as the markets are benchmarking. And so... If we were to get a sign here from this data suggesting that indeed inflation is stickier than the Fed might like it, then Fed rate cut odds for next year are likely to diminish further. And as we've seen, that's negative for stocks here and is biasing them in a downward direction. Now, one thing to keep in mind when we consider today's weak manufacturing ISM number is the price component actually wasn't where the weakness came from. The, the component uh, on new orders looking woefully weak really seemed to be the uh, driver here, but employment on the manufacturing side returning to brisk growth and the actual pricing component coming off only a little bit, having been at the highest level going back uh, to July of 2022, last month. So the trend in manufacturing inflation, as far as the ISM gauge is concerned, is still very much higher. And employment which has been uh, contracting, has just increased for the first time since September of last year. That is gone back to uh, a reading over 50. So the pricing pressures on the manufacturing side remain, even though the headline number was disappointing. The second 
very critical uh, number here, of course, is the U.S. NFP report, non-farm payrolls, the jobs report. The expectation here that we're going to get jobs growth just a hair above where we had it uh, in the prior month, 180,000 jobs added, unemployment rate unchanged of uh, yet again at 3.9%. Now, the key here is, again, the essence of that inflation which is left, which seems to be still locked in the labor market, which is why almost all of what's left in CPI, now at 3.4, in PCE, now at 2.7, is core service sector inflation. That, of course, is also where most employment in the economy lives, the core service sector. So it would seem that the lingering imbalance post-pandemic in labor supply and demand, which still has a 2 million deficit there as of the latest NFP data, and a deficit that isn't going away as quickly as this move from, from a deficit of six started to, and perhaps this is why we're getting stuck here, it certainly seems that way, this is still the main issue. This is still the North Star for the Fed. They see that inflation has come down from nine to three and a half on CPI, from seven to two and a half on PCE, but the employment cost index in the yellow here has come down less than 1%. And it's that deficit that seems to be the cold, uh, the cold right there. So the Fed, not surprisingly, laser focused on this. And as we've just mentioned, the variable on the move seems to be next year's outlook. Because this year's outlook seems to be fairly well anchored. Now, what we've seen as far as U.S. economic data is concerned since about two weeks ago is that there appears to be a shift through the 20-day moving average on the city U.S. economic surprise index, implying that we might be looking at the start of a run of better-than-expected economic data. We can see that when this thing moves through the 20-day moving average, it seems to find follow-through when it does. This is, of course, not guaranteed, but that seems to have been the pattern here. So we've done that again, and we began it with an explosive set of PMI numbers, the strongest growth in a year. So as we look at this, and and by the way, this was just revised today to still higher number. These are the, the initial. They've since been adjusted even stronger. So when we look at this now, the question is, well, what happens if the ISM number surprises on the upside in line with this? And then FP surprises on the upside. What then is the conversation that happens here? And it's probably, if those things occur, that this comes in and becomes less negative. And even though the outlook for this year holds, the outlook for next year gets less dovish. And what that does, perhaps, is weigh on overall risk sentiment. Outside of U.S., land. The other major news event this week is a monetary policy announcement from the European Central Bank. They're expected uh, to cut rates this go-around, so they're expected to uh, start, whereas the Fed still not. As we can see here, a uh, rate cut from 4 to 376, that's one basis point away from a full 25 basis points, which is a negligible difference. Uh, this is pretty much baked in. And if we look through the rest of the year, we can see here's another cut here. By October, we're down to three and a half. And into December, we're flirting with the possibility of a third. So if we look at the total tally for uh, the year, it now stands at 62 basis points. That amounts to 50 basis points in cuts. And if we consider that three cuts, of course, is 75 
basis points if we, and we've gotten 13 basis points in the direction of that third cut that's about a 50 50 shot 52 percent to be uh, exact of a probability that you get a third cut now the situation in europe has actually been going in the right direction as far as growth they had a mild recession in the fourth quarter um, and third quarter of last year but We can see that from the beginning of this year, they seem to have recovered back to positive growth uh, territory. This is the composite PMI index. And we can see that while manufacturing is still uh, very much in contraction territory, the buoyant service sector has pulled the overall economy back north of this 50 boom bust level. And it is now growing and growing at an increasing rate. So... The economy seems to be doing okay, and of course, what that has given us is a stalling of disinflation. CPI numbers that came out last week gave us 2.6% against expectations of 2.5%. So although the broadening of disinflation here is certainly encouraging, and, and although we are within a hair of the ECB's target now, We seem to be getting a little bit held back from at least achieving the central bank's uh, objective on the price side of things because the growth side seems to be a little bit perkier. So although the ECB is almost certainly going to deliver this cut, it would be a wild shock to markets considering the extent to which it's baked in. If they didn't, the euro would skyrocket if they opted not to cut. So... If they were to follow through with what the expectations are, which is what's likely, and cut, the language around that cut might be relatively hawkish, that the ECB might move to say, we don't want to over-extrapolate this cut. We're taking it meeting by meeting. Although the markets are baking in more cuts here, we are not looking to get on a glide path because inflation is getting a little bit jumpy as growth returns. And so although there might be a cut, the language around that cut might be somewhat more hawkish than what the markets are bargaining for. The question is how much more hawkish because of course, as we can see, we've already had a hawkish shift from where we were at the ECB meeting in March to where we were at the ECB meeting in April to now. So if the tone shift from the ECB isn't significant and we get a cut, even if it's a bit hawkish, the markets have perhaps adjusted in that direction already. If it's not hawkish enough to meet these expectations, the most obvious thing that happens is the euro falls. And if it is enough, if in fact the ECB sounds a bit tighter then the markets would like, then that probably means a stronger euro, but local stocks, ETF, EZU, might well suffer. And that is macro money for today. As ever, we are here Monday through Thursday, right after Overtime, a show that I co-host with Dylan Radigan and Chris Vecchio, looking at the Wall Street Glows and what may happen thereafter. I am back on with Chris for Futures Power Hour on Friday, on with Victor Jones for The Price of Truth on Wednesdays, back on with Victor and Tom for First Call Sundays, writing for the news and insights portion of TastyLive.com, and opining sporadically on the platform formerly known as Twitter, at Ilias Pivak. Thanks very much for joining. Macro Money is back tomorrow. See you then.